Hey, my name is Wes, and in this video, I'm going to introduce the Serial Peripheral Interface, also known as SPI or SPI. We'll start off with a high-level description of what SPI is and what it's capable of. SPI is a synchronous serial communication interface defined by Motorola sometime around 1980. Even though it was established so long ago, it's still one of the most commonly used serial communication interfaces. A very common use case is a microcontroller interfacing with external components such as sensors or memory devices. It's generally chosen for short distance communication and has full duplex functionality. As you should already know, full duplex communication means that two devices can transmit and receive data simultaneously. For short distance applications, it may be chosen over some other serial communication protocols such as UART due to its increased data throughput capabilities. Now let's talk about what an SPI bus actually looks like. It consists of a single master device that can communicate with at least one slave device. SPI does not have an imposed limit on the number of slave devices there can be on a single bus, but there are physical limitations that will be covered in the coming slides. The master device is the only device that's permitted to initiate a data transmission. The slave devices can only ever output data when they are enabled or selected by the master device. The master device only ever communicates with a single slave device at a time. There are certain mechanisms that are defined by the protocol that enforce this behavior. While SPI only permits a single master device per bus, other serial protocols such as I2C provide more complex addressing schemes which allow multiple masters to occupy the same bus. There is, however, additional overhead associated with I2C that causes it to have lower overall data transmission rates than SPI. Now the physical interface will be discussed, and later we will explore the protocol, which will define how each signal must behave. There is a de facto standard set of signals used by SPI. The chip select enables or selects a slave device, indicating that it should begin the data transmission process. It is also commonly referred to as slave select. There exist two data transmission signals, MOSI and MISO, which allows data to be transferred bit by bit in between the master device and a slave device. The MOSI line carries data from the master device to a slave device, and the MISO line carries data from a slave device to the master device. Lastly, the serial clock signal is generated by the master device. It controls when each data bit is transmitted and received, and thus it sets the data transmission rate. More details about each of these signals will be covered later in the protocol section of this presentation. Each of the signals that was introduced on the previous slide is shown in this diagram. The arrows indicate the direction of data flow. Note that the MISO signal is the only one that is an input to the master device. This configuration is shown is commonly known as four wire mode. In some applications where there is only one slave device, the chip select may be omitted and the chip select pin on the slave device can be permanently enabled. Other three wire configurations are possible. One example of this is when the MISO signal is not connected. This three wire mode is used when the master device only needs to send commands to the slave device without receiving any data in return. In the opposite case, another three wire configuration is possible by omitting the MOSI signal. This is applicable when the master device only ever needs to read from the slave device. SPI can support multiple slave devices on the same bus, but there are some minor complications that must be handled to support this. As you'll learn later on in the presentation, certain issues arise if multiple slave devices are activated at the same time. A unique chip select signal is required for each slave device connected to the bus, as shown in this diagram. The more slave devices there are on the bus, the more chip select signals are required. In this case, there are three, but it is easy to see how this can get carried away quickly if there are many slave devices required for a given application. When a significant amount of slave devices are required, it may be wise to use a binary decoder to limit the number of I.O. pins used by the master device. In this example, a decoder is added such that only two of the master device's I.O. pins need to be used to enable any one of up to the four slave devices. For example, if the two inputs to the decoder are both zero, then the chip select for slave one would be enabled and the other two would be disabled. Note that in this case, the fourth chip select is not used. 
It's important to know when it's appropriate to use additional hardware such as a decoder. For example, if there are eight slave devices and the master device only has a few extra I.O. pins available, then it would be convenient to use a three to eight decoder. However, if there are again eight slave devices, but the master device has eight or more unused I.O. pins available, then adding a decoder would be a waste of money. Each application should be treated differently. I'd like to reiterate the fact that SPI is a full duplex communication interface. Thus, data can be transmitted and received simultaneously. To implement the protocol, a shift register is generally utilized by both the master device and the slave device or devices where all shift registers are controlled by the same clock signal. Data is shifted out of the master bit by bit into a slave via the MOSI line. At the same time, data is shifted into the master device from a slave device via the MISO line. As you can see in this animation, as each bit gets shifted out from the master device, a bit from the slave device is shifted into the master device. Note that while this animation shows the least significant bit being shifted out first, that is not always the case. The most significant bit can also be shifted out first, it just depends on the application and the slave device's requirements. It may help to watch this animation repeat a few times to try to visualize how the bits are shifted in and out simultaneously. Now that the physical interface has been defined, let's discuss the protocol. The interface describes the physical requirements such as hardware connections, data directions, etc. And the protocol describes the specific rules and parameters that dictate the manner in which each signal must operate for a set of devices to communicate successfully. To start off our description of the protocol for SPI, we will discuss the chip select signal. The chip select signal indicates when a slave device should begin and end its transmission and reception of data. It is typically an active low signal, so it must be set and held low during the time period in which a slave device is enabled. As mentioned previously, if there are multiple slave devices on the same bus, there must be a chip select signal for each of them to select which one the master device desires to communicate with. Having multiple chip selects prevents multiple slave devices from attempting to drive the MISO line simultaneously. This would more than likely cause bus contention errors resulting in an unsuccessful application. Next up, we have the two data lines, MOSI and MISO. Each bit of data is transmitted and received via these signals, and timing is controlled by the master via the clock signal that it generates. The data can be sent and received in two different orders, either most significant bit first or least significant bit first. Often this is mandated by a certain slave device. And finally, we have the serial clock signal. It's generated by the master device and controls when each data bit is shifted in or out of each device. Each slave device, whether it's some sensor or some type of memory, will have some limit that it must impose on the serial clock frequency. It's the responsibility of the programmer to configure the master device in such a way that its serial clock frequency never exceeds the rate imposed by the slave device. The limitations of each slave device must be studied carefully by reading the relevant device's datasheet. A serial clock frequency in the range of 10 MHz is fairly common for a lot of slave devices. The two other parameters associated with the clock signal that need to be configured are polarity and phase. The serial clock's polarity determines its idle voltage level. For example, if the polarity is low, then the clock signal has a low voltage when it's idle and no data is being transmitted. The phase determines which edge of the serial clock signal is used to sample each bit of data. Data is set up on the positive edge of each sample. This is necessary to give time for each bit to become stable before it is sampled by the receiving device. Polarity and phase were two parameters that were defined early on when Motorola originally defined SPI. A lot of integrated circuit vendors today still use the standard. Since there are generally two different options for each of these parameters, there are four possible modes of operation as shown in the table on the right. As you can see in this timing diagram, for modes 0 and 1, the clock polarity is low. In other words, the clock line is at a low voltage level when it's idle. Conversely, for modes 2 and 3, the clock polarity is high, indicating a high voltage in the idle state. We can also see here that for modes 0 and 3, 
Each data bit is sampled on the rising edges of the clock indicated by the upward facing arrows. For modes 1 and 2, each data bit is sampled on the falling edge of the clock indicated by downward facing arrows. To summarize, the polarity determines the inactive state of the clock and the phase determines which edge of the clock each data bit is sampled. When initializing an SPI system, the master device must ensure that the clock signal it generates has the same phase and polarity that is required by a slave device. Since SPI is commonly used for interfacing with external sensors, let's show some possibilities. The first of which is an inertial measurement unit, or IMU, which is used to determine the position, orientation, or movement of some system. They usually contain an accelerometer and or gyroscope, but they often contain a magnetometer as well. More examples would be a temperature sensor, a barometer, which measures atmospheric pressure, and an analog to digital converter, commonly referred to as an ADC, which measures an analog signal or a physical voltage value and converts it to a digital value that can be used within a digital system. SPI is commonly used to increase the amount of IO signals a particular master device can handle. For example, if an application requires a microcontroller with a relatively low pin count, then a device that translates between serial and parallel data, commonly referred to as an IO expander, can be used. This parallel data can then be used as if it were normal IO pins while only using a few of the microcontroller pins, the, one used, the ones that are used for serial communication. These types of devices internally act as shift registers, although a simple shift register by itself could successfully interpret the SPI protocol. In some applications, when the internal memory of some device or computing system, for example a microcontroller, is insufficient, either a larger microcontroller device must be used, or external memory devices can be employed. External memory devices are often accessed via some form of serial communication, and SPI is commonly used because of its high data rates. SPI is used in a variety of applications within embedded systems, and if you continue working on anything in this subject area, you're bound to come across a situation where you need to know how to use it. Most of the time, you should choose from a variety of communication protocols, not solely use the one you're most familiar with. Each serial communication protocol has its own strengths and weaknesses that should be considered for each unique application. For example, if the application requires short distance, fast data rates, SPI may be considered. If it requires a lot of different slave devices or multiple master devices on the same bus, try I2C. Sometimes the peripheral device that you need to communicate with only supports a single protocol. In that case, you hardly have a choice. Therefore, you must be flexible and understand more than just one communication protocol.